Hello and welcome uh, to another session of uh, Digital Slide Review. Uh, I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, and our project is uh, made possible by the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, a joint venture with the uh, Digital Pathology Association and PATH Presenter. Our focus today is uh, going to be um, drawn from the realm of GI pathology. Um, but as typical, our cases come from where I'm located on the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, home of the Stevenson Cancer Center. So our topic is uh, juvenile polyps uh, of the GI tract. And uh, the cases and slides we'll look at could have easily come from all the same person, uh, as these uh, patients tend to have multiple uh, polyps over the course of uh, their lives. Um, this is uh, an excellent uh, example to start with. Um, this uh, is important to uh, note that this came from an adult, not from a uh, uh, adolescent or child, um, because the name or the term juvenile polyps uh, refers only to the type of polyp, uh, which can present in, in childhood, but uh, may present at any time during the course of one's life. Uh, and this low power image is a very potent one to remind us of the features of these polyps. Uh, one of the common features is uh, this uh, glandular dilatation uh, deep in the stroma and a fairly uh, innocuous uh, bland stroma uh, with epithelium uh, that uh, in most circumstances does not show dysplasia. Um, although we'll get to that possibility a little bit later on. Uh, as you can see here, we're looking at a uh, mucinous type of epithelium uh, that has uh, some architectural complexity, uh, but uh, no cytologic atypia. Uh, there is some associated normal elements, maybe some uh, lymphoid stroma and vessels, uh, but very loose stroma. And in contrast to another video we did recently of uh, Putz-Jaeger's polyps, we don't see much in the way of smooth muscle uh, in these polyps. Uh, so all of this stroma is just very loose uh, fibromyxoid tissue. Uh, there's not the streaming, uh, arborizing smooth muscle uh, that we saw with uh, Putz-Jaeger's uh, hamartomatous polyps. So that summarizes quite nicely uh, the, the features that we expect, uh, cytologically normal epithelium, uh, deep cystic glandular dilatation, uh, branching vessels, but no uh, arborizing smooth muscle. Now, another feature uh, that is uh, notable here, and we see this right here, where the, we have an accentuation of inflammation and vessels, and you can pick that up at low magnification. Um, and it's not uncommon, particularly because many of these polyps present in the rectosigmoid area, that we will see some measure of uh, surface erosion, uh, and secondary to that, uh, some uh, reactive granulation type vas vasculature and inflammation. So seeing these areas of eroded surface mucosa uh, with some reactive changes, vessels, is another feature that uh, uh, often unifies these polyps uh, because they're subject to uh, trauma in the fecal stream, if you will. Uh, the surface uh, mucosa can get rubbed off uh, by fecal material passing by. So let's take another look at another uh, example uh, here to see the variation on the theme. Uh, we again see at low magnification these deep glandular dilatation uh, vessels. We see some pink stroma here, but we don't see the arborizing uh, smooth muscle that we've mentioned for other hamartomas. Um, and the epithelium looks to be sort of complex, glandular, basally non-atypical, basally oriented nuclei, not atypical, uh, maybe a little crowding here, um, and uh, otherwise normal stromal elements. These cystic spaces usually do not erupt into the stroma, but they can, as we see here, uh, this epithelium becomes very attenuated and uh, this cyst is actually ruptured and producing uh, maybe a little bit of uh, a giant cell response, perhaps, certainly some uh, intramucinous uh, 
uh, inflammatory cells with EOs and so forth. It's not, however, the tumor diathesis kind of uh, a picture that we would uh, see with uh, uh, ruptured glands in uh, carcinomas, um, nor is it uh, quite typical for uh, mucinous carcinoma. So there is a, another example uh, of the features that can be seen. Now, lest you find me redundant, I'm going to give you another example. Uh, this one uh, nicely illustrated a somewhat smaller one, uh, but here we can see the uh, the stalk of this polyp, and we see that the stalk has uh, normal colonic uh, elements here, the cauterized margin here, um, and then this uh, surface area here shows just a little bit of uh, fibrosis, and that's probably related to the fact that here uh, we have this very uh, ulcerated inflammatory surface. So uh, this could be termed, uh, in some cases, just an inflammatory polyp. Um, and we would wonder, perhaps no more, maybe this is a um, solitary rectal ulcer or something. But this deep glandular dilatation uh, is a recurring theme in these juvenile polyps. And so I think in this case, if I were signing this case out, I would say, you know, uh, uh, polypoid uh, structure with deep glandular dilatation, surface ulceration, and granulation tissue, most consistent with juvenile polyp with secondary surface ulceration. Here again, we see this large cyst, and this is one that's where we've had some hemorrhage into the cyst with even a little bit of a thrombus type formation. But this haphazard arrangement of the uh, dilated cystic structures uh, with variable contours, uh, indentations, bulges, and so forth, is quite characteristic of uh, juvenile polyps. Are you ready for another example? Uh, guess what this is? Well, of course, this is another nice example of a juvenile polyp. Deep glandular dilatation, uh, sort of uh, complex uh, mucosa, uh, but benign, similar to what we would see elsewhere in the colon, um, and uh, stroma pretty much devoid of smooth muscle, uh, normal stromal elements in terms of inflammation, vessels, and uh, some uh, loose fibromyxoid tissue. I don't know that we had uh, ulceration on this uh, polyp. Oh, yeah, maybe a little bit of ulceration and hemorrhage up here. So the theme is uh, quite nicely complete with these large bulky polyps. And uh, I haven't mentioned distribution here. Juvenile polyps uh, can occur at pretty much any site in the uh, GI tract, but they are most common in the large bowel. And hence what we've seen so far uh, is strictly colonic type mucosa. Uh, but they can occur in the stomach or the small bowel where Rather than seeing colonic type epithelium, we would expect to see gastric or um, small bowel type of mucosa. Here's yet one more example, again, one with a polyp, uh, or excuse me, a stalk, uh, showing the feeder vessel up into here uh, and this uh, uh, normal colonic mucosa here. Now, uh, looking at this, we might say, well, gee, maybe we have a little bit of uh, muscle stroma in here. Um, but as you'll see here, this, what looks like is muscle, is really just the vasculature. So there is an arborizing vasculature in these polyps, uh, but it's not uh, cords and bands of uh, smooth muscle usually. Well, here's a little smooth muscle even. Um, so one might, in a case like this, say, well, do we have enough? Um, probably not quite enough to call this a Putz-Jaeger's polyp. I think it's going to fit better. Uh, with uh, a uh, juvenile polyp. Now, this one, however, uh, illustrates the other uh, feature to be watched for, and that is the development of uh, dysplasia. And if you remember from our uh, primer on GI polyps, uh, where we covered uh, dysplasia, very often dysplasia begins at the surface. Um, and what we're seeing here is maybe a suggestion that that's happening because here we see some areas where we've lost 
uh, mucinous structure. We've got a little bit of hyperchromasia, some alteration in the architecture. Um, these are a little bit more closely spaced, a little bit more irregular, uh, hyperchromatic, certainly compared to their neighbors. Uh, and so one might be concerned about the possible development of uh, dysplasia in an area like this. Um, that uh, reminds us that these polyps do have a uh, small but not zero uh, risk, increased risk of uh, developing malignancy and hence uh, follow up in patients with recognized juvenile polyposis syndromes uh, is uh, appropriate for screening to exclude uh, subsequent development of neoplasia. And because most of the uh, dysplasia that development develops is by the uh, um, adenoma, um, uh, the adenomatous uh, uh, pathway rather than the uh, uh, serrated pathway, uh, the time frame can be uh, appropriately adjusted to uh, every few years. Now, uh, let's take a uh, maybe a more common example. What do we do with a polyp like this? Um, well, uh, in the absence of a history, we might just be very descriptive. Uh, but if this is a polyp from the rectosigmoid, we're not going to call it a uh, um, an adenomatous or a serrated polyp. It doesn't have those features. It does have some surface erosion. And notice that we have the deep glandular dilatation. Um, we don't have smooth muscle. Uh, so it's a very small, isolated polyp. Uh, we need to think of and ask the question, could this be a, a juvenile type polyp? And the answer is yes, it does have some of the features that we associated with a juvenile polyp. Um, does this patient have juvenile polyposis syndrome? Uh, well, certainly making that diagnosis on the basis of a single polyp is not uh, meeting the uh, generally approved diagnostic criteria. But if this is one of many similar polyps, uh, it certainly can contribute to that uh, diagnosis. Or if this is a polyp seen on first examination in a first degree relative of someone who does have juvenile polyposis syndrome, then it probably does rise to that uh, status of being a diagnostic biopsy. And one last example, again, a small biopsy. Uh, again, here noting uh, some mild deep glandular dilatation, um, a little bit of surface ulceration and erosion. So uh, is this an inflammatory polyp? Is it a juvenile polyp? Well, many times those uh, lesions overlap, uh, but here we also know we seem to have maybe a little degree of possible early dysplasia or uh, alteration in the cytology uh, in this particular uh, group of glands uh, here, raising concern for that. And so levels or further evaluation to determine if we really do have dysplasia developing uh, would be pertinent. But notice again, the stroma is very characteristic, this loose fibromyxoid stroma and uh, some deep uh, mild glandular dilatation uh, in an otherwise uh, 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 normal uh, epithelium type polyp uh, should prompt us to think about uh, juvenile polyposis. So uh, that's a sequence of uh, cases to think about. Um, and a study, if you'd like to come back and review the digital slides, the link will be in the uh, comments. Um, this is an autosomal dominant disorder. Um, it uh, results from dysregulation of the TGF beta pathway uh, and produces these hamartomatous polyps that can occur throughout the GI tract, most commonly in the rectosigmoid. Uh, to diagnose the juvenile polyposis syndrome, uh, you need to see more than five such polyps in the colon or multiple juvenile type polyps at anywhere in the GI tract or the family history of juvenile polyposis syndrome and any single uh, juvenile type polyp at any site uh, in the bowel. So those are the three uh, routes to uh, making the diagnosis. Uh, of course, the pathology uh, uh, community usually doesn't uh, convey that to the patient, but uh, being aware of the implications of your diagnosis uh, is, is important uh, in this scenario. 
Well, that's a summary today then of our juvenile polyps of the colon. Uh, we searched in vain for a, a stomach example, uh, but I'll have to find one later on. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this discussion, and if you did, uh, please subscribe or share this with your friends and colleagues. Uh, if you subscribe, you should uh, also get news of uh, upcoming uh, releases, similar material. Uh, and as always, we welcome your comments and feedback uh, and hope that uh, now having seen uh, uh, five or six examples of juvenile polyp polyps, uh, that you won't miss the next one that comes across your desk. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you again soon.